My guest today is Christian Goyer Pullman. Christian, how are you? Thanks. I am very well. Uh, is it? Have I said your name correctly? My, you pronounced my name very well. Well, it's yes. to me to learn. Vielen Dank. It's freut mich auch Sie kennenzulernen. <laughs> Danke. <laughs> uh, uh, let's talk about Erlang. Yes. I understand you know a lot about Erlang. No. Well, well, I'm pretty excited about Erlang, so okay. to say. Um, so today it's 2019, something end of 2019, and between just barely, it's barely a couple right? of weeks left. And and be be between 2003 and 2011, I was always commuting. I had a, I, I had a daily commute like 90 kilometers in the morning, and I was listening to .NET Rocks. I was ah, you know becoming a .NET programmer. Joined Microsoft. Um, Microsoft Research Lab in Aachen, and um, I was listening to .NET on my way to Aachen and back, and they were often, there were sometimes, I think they had Brian Hunter. Brian Hunter well. I sp was on my show eight and a half years ago, talking right. about Erlang. <laughs> and after you told me about this, I downloaded that interview as well. Yeah, exactly. So so they were talking about Erlang and what, what that technology is, uh -huh. and um, over the last couple of years, I got more and more interested in it. Um, when I looked at the f at it at the first time, like the language sounded looked really bizarre to me. Hmm. Um, but it's it's kind of it's it's four different things. So if yeah. you if you haven't heard about Erlang in the past, um, when you look at .NET, .NET came out I think in the early 2000s, like 2001 or so, I believe. Maybe maybe 2000, I think. Maybe 2000, some, something around that mm -hmm. space, right? You know, Java like five years earlier, mm -hmm. like in the in the mid of the 90s. And actually, Erlang came out in the mid of the 80s, like 1985 or so something. So it's a pretty old as computer language. It's, it's well, it's it's not only a language; it's a virtual machine. So well, it's never been a virtual machine in a language. So it's a virtual machine in the same sense that Java and Clojure and Scala run on the Java virtual machine, mm -hmm. and F Sharp and C Sharp and VB.NET run on the common language runtime from Microsoft. Okay. So in that sense, it's it's a virtual machine which basically executes, um, you know, instructions, not which are not assembly instructions, but VM instructions, like. Mm -hmm like common language runtime code okay. from, from the .NET So it's side. closer to the metal than, say, C Sharp, for example? Well, it, 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 in the same way that C Sharp compiles down into intermediate language mm -hmm. to run on the CLR, Erlang code also compiles down into bytecode to run on the so-called Beam. Mm -hmm. So the Beam, Bogdan's Erlang abstract machine or something, mm -hmm. is basically the virtual machine underpinning, underpinning Erlang. Okay. Um, and initially, so Erlang came out, the Erlang virtual machine and the language came out of Ericsson Research. So um, Ericsson, the phone company. Ericsson, the phone company in, 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 in Sweden, exactly. And um, one of the inventors, um, I mean, we both work for Microsoft. Yes. And um, we have this, this, this format um, about, you know, people giving talks for Microsoft Research. And in one very old talk, um, Joe Armstrong, one of the inventors of Erlang, described a little bit the story where, you know, Ericsson Research was funded. They didn't know, you know, where to spend their time. And they said, hey, let's invent something which makes actually shipping software for phone switches, for publicly switched telephone networks easier. And they said, okay, what's the most important thing for phone switches? It's reliability and up uptime. Right. Right. I mean, basically, when you call the fire brigade that your house is burning, you don't want the phone call to be dropped just because some software update on the switch is coming. That would so. be more than frustrating. That would be really bad, exactly. And so they, they, they were wondering about how should a programming system should look like um, for allowing SLAs with many, many nines of availability, so mm, to say. Okay. So they said, okay, we need to think about, you know, fault tolerance needs to be part of the virtual machine of the system. Things like, um, you know, detecting errors and restarting faulty processes need to be part of the system. And they also said, okay, we need to look into um, modeling the physical world. So when, for example, I send you a data packet, mm -hmm. like at some point in time when I sent the data packet to you and you're on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, that data packet actually, with the speed of light, needs a couple of milliseconds mm -hmm. to reach your computer for you to make a decision and so on. And so while many of our nice programming abstractions assume everything's on the same CPU and instantly there, mm. in practice that's never the case. And okay. so the, desi the designers of Erlang 
thought about how can we model this. And what they came up with, what later became known as the actor model, is a system where you say you spin up a unit of compute, some process which is running on your machine, and you can have many processes running on your machine. Think in the easy abstraction about threads mm -hmm. on, on your processor. But now you can have tens of thousands of these processes on your laptop, and they can all work at the same time. And the only way for these things to talk to each other is sending each other messages. Hmm. Okay. So, um, so basically all the data structures are immutable and so on. And so in the middle of the 80s, they came up with this technology for phone switches. Moving now a couple years forward, you know, we all know like Moore's law, in the sense of processors getting faster each time. Yeah, uh, doubling every 18 months. Doubling every 18 months is no longer true, right? I mean, we, we now look into multi-core structures. Like right. when we look at virtual machines on Azure, we have, I think, 128 cores or something like some crazy amount of yeah. virtual CPU cores on a physical machine. And if you now want to think about how can I spread compute to maximum leverage this number of cores, you need different programming models. And so this is suddenly where these technologies, these battle-tested technologies from the mid of the 80s, come up again and become relevant. Hmm. And um, so when you, when you look at the Erlang system overall, it's, it's basically, I would say, from my perspective, it's four different things. It's the Erlang virtual machine, which has this notion of actor model, message passing, immutable, data, many processes on a single computer. Sounds like a functional in. language. And then you have a functional language, which is the Erlang programming language on top of it. Mm -hmm, okay. So you program in the Erlang programming language for the Erlang VM. I see. Then they have a, I would say, a battle-tested set of helper libraries called OTP, Open Telecom Platform something. It has, still has a telecom name in it, but effectively it's a, it's a robust set of libraries for handling things such as restarting processes which crashed, supervising that you know all the things which should do work are still doing work, you know handling state and so on. Hmm. So these are kind of the three things which form Erlang if you download the installer to your Windows machine or to your Linux machine or whatever. Hmm. When I looked at the language I totally didn't get it. Like I looked like 10 years ago I uh -huh. looked into the language and it didn't click. It wasn't I, like any other language you had seen before. Yeah, it, so I'm not a computer science guy. I'm, I'm an electrical engineer by trade. And mm. apparently Erlang is- A PhD um, in electrical engineering, I heard. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah I, had, I had no hobby at the time, right? <laughs> so um, so it's, it's, it's very heavily inspired by Prolog. Prolog? Okay. Prolog, uh, the language. And for me, it didn't really click. I was interested, but I had no necessity to really use mm. it. Um, then a couple of years ago, um, some guy from the Ruby on Rails core team, um, I think a Brazilian guy called Jose Valim, he was basically saying, hey, I'm, I, I love, you know, syntax of Ruby and so on, but I need a, I want a platform that is more performant, more reliable and so on. Hmm. And so um, that person, Jose Valim, basically took the time and said, I, I will design a language which on the outside looks like Ruby. Hmm. So it's very appealing, you know, that you have an easier path to take up on the language, uh -huh. but it compiles down to Erlang so and runs, runs on, on the Erlang the virtual thing. machine. Exactly, exactly. So, um, and then of course, when an ecosystem grows, then you had folks like Chris McCord who created a web framework on top of it called Phoenix. Hmm. So now you have basically this web framework, which resonates very well with Ruby programmers and so on, which is extremely performant. Um, and you know, you have, you know, response times, HTTP response times in the microsecond range. Like you're wondering, hmm. like, this is really just, just amazingly fast, right? Um, and the whole thing on a battle tested, so to say, virtual machine. And this is particularly interesting from my perspective in all scenarios where you talk about handling massive concurrency. So a couple of years back in 2014, for example, I was building together with a partner in Germany a system for, you know, the question was how can we terminate like 2 million plus WebSocket connections 
on in a cluster, how can we in a sub-second range play out notifications? So this was originally for a quiz show in the German television. Hmm. And um, it was later then used for the Neurovision Song Contest. So the Neurovision Song Contest is, I would say, the largest music festival mm. on the planet. Right. Um, and they now use the backend which we designed on Azure using ah. .NET and SignalR hmm. um, to basically, when, for example, a new artist goes on stage, you know, plays, plays, play out all the notifications to the Android and iOS mobile devices that, you know, they can sing along with the song and so on in a, in hmm. a, in a you know, if I would do design that thing today, I would certainly go for you know the Erlang VM with Elixir on top of it, and and, and when Elixir you Elixir is Elix, Elixir Elixir is exactly this Ruby style okay. language, That's which un, you know, kind of the Trojan horse, which hmm. looks like Ruby but runs on the beam on, on the Erlang VM. Um, yeah, and so because I'm just enthusiastic about the whole thing, I said, okay, how can I learn more about it? Mm -hmm. And I started to, you know, whenever I talk to, you know, Azure folks, they say, hey, it's interesting, but it's not our main target market right now. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, let's create some SDKs for it. So I started with creating an SDK for pretty much all the Azure resource manager management APIs. Hmm. So that from Elixir code, you can basically, you know, spin up a virtual machine, create a storage account, create a Postgres database, delete a machine, you know, all that type These of stuff. These are just uh, wrappers written in Elixir to exactly. call the web services, the exactly. rest services. Yes, that that's, that, that's, that's correct, exactly. Okay. So it basically uses an open API generator, mm -hmm. which uses our Swagger files to um, talk to, you know, to generate all these client-side proxies. Mm -hmm. Um, the uh, other thing, I mean, we have certain APIs where we don't have Swagger specifications. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Azure Storage, when you want to um, talk to an Azure block blob or a page blob or an append blob, you know, when you want to, want to upload a file to Azure or when you want to send a message into an Azure queue, you need to have a very certain REST style yes. API. And so for Azure Storage, I create hand, created an a, I would say a comparably clean library to talk to these APIs because I think like right now when Elixir developers and Erlang developers look for you know your friendly cloud around the corner where they can run their stuff many go to you know companies like DigitalOcean um, to you know Google now has uh, released an official Elixir SDKs as part mm -hmm. of some community effort there are some SDKs for, for Amazon and I was just interested to you know get something out for Azure yeah. as well. And you've open sourced this project. It's totally open source, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. So that's that's kind of, and, and then a, a couple of other things where I was just testing the boundaries of the language. Hmm. So for example, like, um, I, I do not know if you are, are you familiar with Azure Resource Manager templates? Yes. I mean, Azure Resource Manager templates are this kind of JSON structure where you send a big description of all the resources which you want to have created in Azure to Azure, and it has this very particular syntax for kind of the string values where you can compute certain values inside the template. Hmm, okay. And so generally it's declarative. You just, exactly. Uh, you just tell it what you want and figure exactly. out how to get there. Exactly. But you can add some calculations there. Yeah, exactly. So for example, an easy example could be you can say angle bracket mm -hmm. add uh, brace 3 comma 4, and it's basically saying call the add function and pass it 3 and 4. Mm. And this evaluates to seven, right? Okay. And so one thing that I struggled with is when I create an ARM template, I sometimes write rather complicated template language expressions. And I basically need to throw them over. I In the past, I needed to send them to Azure. And then just after two minutes, figure out I forget a curly brace or something right. somewhere. That was very annoying. So I created a small utility which basically reads a file locally from my disk and ARM template file, have completely el evaluates it locally, except for some functions like give me the cryptographic storage account key of that storage account, for which I need to call into Azure to fetch the real value, okay. and then store a local template file with all the expanded values. So you basically say run the whole thing, and half a second later, you have the same JSON file, the whole, the same ARM template, all white spaces, all comments, and so on, where they belong, mm -hmm. but all the values are substituted. So it makes it a lot easier to debug. 
Exactly. You see that At in least, the video yeah, exactly, exactly. So my debugging experience was 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 getting radically better. So and to you say. wrote that in Erlang or in Elixir? In Elixir, yes, exactly. So um, so there is um, actually by the by the guy um, who invented Elixir, Jose Valim, he has some. Um, parser combinator library, some basically a library which allows you to create a parser. Hmm. So I've wrote my own JSON parser, first of all, with this library. Hmm. Um, I mean, not that Elixir doesn't have already a sufficient amount of JSON parsers, but for my particular scenario, I didn't want to read JSON and serialize it in a generic way. I wanted to keep all the white spaces and all okay. the comments outside of the content right. where they are so mm. that my document structure and the second document doesn't change. It's all about readability in that it, case. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, what is in line 23 should remain in line 23. Well, it and sounds so like you have a hobby now. I totally, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's amazing. So you've taken a language that uh, you just heard about on a podcast. You dove into it enough to build some serious open source projects around this that people are actually out there using in the wild. You, I, I, well, I know a couple, a handful of guys and, and gals are using it right now. Um, I don't, I, I have the hope and the dream that, you know, there will be more Azure usage following these SDKs. Well, send me, but send me the pointer to the uh, the yeah. repositories, and we'll get them yeah, out absolutely, there. Yeah, the, absolutely, absolutely. The 17 or 18 people that watch my show. Absolutely. <laughs> one of them might contribute. <laughs> By the way, one thing which I forgot to mention, like when you think about who the heck uses Erlang yeah. on the planet, have you sent a WhatsApp recently? Kind of WhatsApp is supposed WhatsApp is written in Erlang? WhatsApp, what the whole WhatsApp backend is, is written in Erlang. Wow. Like, um, if you think about databases like React, mm -hmm. it's in Erlang. Wow. If you heard about RabbitMQ, mm -hmm. the messaging yeah. um, software, it's Erlang. If you think about um, Discord, you know, the company yeah. um, the, who the runs chat. chat kind of thing. Exactly, yeah. chat servers for, for games and so on. They basically have implemented the whole presence protocol for 11 million something players in a combination of Elixir and Rust. You know. what's, th what's the appeal? Is it the fault tolerance or the speed or a exactly. combination of them? It's yeah, both yeah. those two. I Usually think, there's I a trade-off between those. Well, the, the interesting thing is when you, when you think about you have a Java or a .NET application mm -hmm. running somewhere on a remote node. You know, in today's distributed world, you need to think about, you know, consensus protocols, getting quorum across many machines and so on, right? So you send a network packet to that Java box over there and the Java box doesn't respond. And there can be multiple ways. It can be dead or it can be dead alive, which means it's just garbage collecting something mm. and it freezes the world and doesn't reply to you. Oh, so see. it's totally up and healthy, but you don't know is the box down, is the network down, it doesn't reply to you. Mm. And um, Erlang is designed in a way that out of these, you know, hundreds of thousands of processes which can run on your physical host, each process that has something to do is guaranteed to be scheduled. Mm -hmm. So even yeah. if the load increases on your machine, you know all your processes get their fair share of computational power. Okay. And this makes it very interesting for these massively concurrently connected um, um, systems. Oh, so if you have a, a massive load, then performance may suffer, yeah. but at least it's guaranteed to actually happen. Absolutely, yeah. So, so you, you also have these things like the application seems locked. Mm -hmm. You know, the application doesn't react, and you open, you know, um, HTOP or process monitor or something, and look at the machine, and the CPU cores are idling at, you know, 20%, 10% something, or if you're in a bad situation, at 3%. Mm -hmm. Is that good or not if your CPU is down? Certainly, it's a sign that you know you have some blocking thing right. regarding to I/O. When you look at various you know Erlang deployments, it's not uncommon to see a CPU at 100%. Hmm. You're like, hmm, my CPU is at 100%. Is that bad? Certainly not. It just means you leverage all the CPU cores you paid for, okay. and you are happily crunching away through all the work, right? I mean, unless you have some stupid you know infinite loop or so, which, right, which right. keeps everything busy. <laughs> But uh, even if you have an infinite loop, your infinite loop cannot steal 100% of the CPU from all the rest of the system. It'll just get, once it gets to 100%, it'll exactly, queue up everything, all exactly, the requests behind exactly. it. Exactly. Uh, very cool. This is a lot of information. What uh, people want to dig more into Erlang or into Elixir, where's a good place to go? 
Uh, well, I think the, the 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 best place to go is um, I mean, the, so for well, go to an, a search engine of your choice and mm -hmm. look for Elixir and for Erling, of course. The um, the Elixir forum on the internet is a very friendly place. Like if you ask questions on that kind of fo uh, on that website, the Elixir forum. Um, you get answers quite quick, quickly. You can go into the Slack of the Elixir community, mm -hmm. um, and there are plenty of great books. So, for example, um, Dave um, Dave Thomas, you know, one of the guys from the Pragmatic Programmers, oh, yeah. um, wrote awesome books about you know programming Elixir. Um, Pragmatic Programmers in general has very interesting um, books. Um, a Elixir in Action from Manning from a um, I believe Croatian guy. Um, uh, Zaza Juric, I'm sure I mispronounce his name, um, is an awesome resource. So I think if I would go into this, I would start learning about Elixir to have, a, I would say, a more welcoming place to learn about it. And when you're ready, you will feel the desire to dig deeper and understand Erling under the hood. Makes and sense. at some point in time, it won't make, doesn't matter to you any longer whether it's Erling or Elixir. Excellent. Do you have an online presence? Uh, yes, my uh, so on Twitter I am C H G E U E R C H mm -hmm. Goya Christian Goya Poyman, which is my Microsoft email address as well. If you want to spam me, um, and on uh, blog.goyapoyman.de is kind of my blog where I occasionally write notes to myself. Excellent, Christian. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. <laughs> My statement in terms of bringing the two words, friends and technology, together is like, regardless of how interested we are in technology and tinkering with things, we shouldn't forget about spending a decent amount of time with our friends. I mean, when we are kind of at the end, um, we, I'm, I'm sure we won't wonder why we didn't you know, build that other thing while we could have spent some time with, with friends and family. So make sure not only computers. <laughs>